I'm Fran Burwell, Distinguished Fellow at the Europe Center of the Atlantic Council. Welcome to this uh, seminar on what will it take for the EU to enlarge. Enlargement is now back on the agenda of the European Union. For some time, enlargement had seemed stuck with the potential accession of candidate countries uh, so far off that it didn't require much immediate thought by European politicians and think tankers. Um, also, many of the countries under consideration were small and one could argue that would not be especially taxing for the EU to take in. Uh, but Ukraine has changed all that. Not only has Ukraine made clear its ambition for membership, um, but the EU has, of course, brought, the e brought Ukraine and Moldova in as candidate countries. And this has really um, reignited the debate over enlargement. Um, we are very much uh, privileged here today to have two members of a Franco-German study uh, that was commissioned by those governments and will, I think, set the path of the debate uh, over the next year or so uh, as Europe thinks about how to enlarge, when to enlarge, and in some cases, whether to enlarge. Um, but this is not to this discussion today is not to focus so much on the accession countries, but to uh, talk about what the EU needs to do in order to be ready itself for, the, for that accession. Um, we have with us today, uh, Daniela Schwarzer, um, who is an exec a member of the executive board of the Bertelsmann uh, Foundation, and uh, previously was the director of uh, DGAP in Berlin, um, Shaheen Vallet, who is a senior research fellow at the Center for Geopolitics, Geoeconomics, and Technology. I should say that Daniela was a co-rapporteur on the report, and Shaheen was a member of the 12-person uh, group uh, commissioned by the French and Ger German governments. We have um, Bart Koch, who is a program director at the Warsaw Security Forum. And we have Dmitry, Dmitry Nomenko, uh, who is a senior analyst at the Ukrainian Center for European Policy. Daniela, let's start with you. Uh, it's a very comprehensive report, um, but I'm gonna ask you to introduce it by giving us a summary, both of um, how the group, maybe put a, a few sentences in about how the group approached the work and the reaction you've had in Europe, but let's focus on what you have recommended. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fran, for, for having me and, and us on this call um, and to speak about the report and, and its repercussions. So our group was put together earlier this year and was mandated by the French and the German governments um, around the anniversary of the Elysee Treaty in January. And we were asked to submit a report by September. The mandate was to look at how the European Union needs to reform institutionally, and uh, that means we looked at options that are, you know, can be done within the framework of the existing Lisbon Treaty, but we also looked at the big questions of treaty reform. The way we structured our work was, first of all, we, we had a very broad and wide discussion um, within the group of 12, always a French and a German member preparing a topic together, and we had auditions with very many representatives of other EU countries or researchers from across the EU, uh, also from candidate countries. So we, as a Franco-German group, really tried to have a trans-European conversation on the issue and trans-European in the sense of not EU only, but also candidate countries. We then had to structure all the great ideas we had and the input we got. And we said, we will select reform proposals that pay into at least one of three goals and ideally into two or three of them. So one is to make the EU enlargement ready, meaning to be able to deal with more members, possibly eight more or even 10 more and more diverse members. Surely if you look at the EU today, it's very different from the EU of the eighties. So member state preferences already with each enlargement have become more divergent. And this will surely also be the case with the next enlargement round. So making the EU enlargement ready, the second point, um, enhancing the EU's capacity to act. And with that point, you know, we actually meant to say something, and that is the EU needs reform, not only in order to be able to enlarge, 
but really also to function better in a completely changed geopolitical context and with new internal challenges. And on top of those two goals, we, we set out the third one uh, for our own work, and that is reform proposals should contribute to democratic legitimacy and strengthen the rule of law. Now, within that triangle, we came up with a number of proposals which concern the institutional functioning, such as the setup of the European Commission or the extension of qualified majority vote in the council. And we looked at all of that, but we said, well, very fundamentally, we want to start with something different. And we started to really explain why we think rule of law as a fundamental principle, principle of the European Union needs to be strengthened and the mechanisms to protect rule of law for the EU today, but also for an enlarged EU need to be made much stronger. And that is really the basic message of our report. So we say the EU is a functioning model which needs improvement, which needs to be stronger in defending its own principles in a geopolitically more adverse world. And it needs to be able to protect those principles even when it grows for another eight or 10 members. Um, this idea of defending rule of law is not only necessary to protect the EU's internal functioning, for instance, the single market with the four liberties doesn't work if rule of law is not guaranteed in all member states. And we really see the limits of the model with the backsliding that is happening in Poland or and now can be corrected um, and the, the backsliding that, ha that happened in Hungary. But the rule of law for us is so central because it also is important that the EU is able to project its own model and be attractive to incoming member states and make, make it very clear what the expectations are for countries to join. So right now, the credibility of the European Union from the perspective of candidate countries is weakened in two regards. One is for years, there was no real movement on getting the EU enlargement ready and on negotiating with um, future member countries. The second reason why it has lost credibility is because it wasn't able to defend its own principles internally. So that's why we lay down this chapter really as the fundamental approach of the report. Then we look at all the institutional issues. I won't go into detail now, but Shaheen and I can answer questions later. But I want to add two more things. We also, and this is slightly interpreting our mandate, we go into two other big issues which are essential for the EU as functioning um, now, but also in an enlarged setup. And that is the competencies the EU has, where we say, basically, we have seen that throughout the past crisis years, the EU has on several occasions actually extended its competencies. The first example was the um, sovereign debt and banking crisis in the euro area, where the EU actually created new mechanisms uh, that ideally would have been codified in primary law, such as the European Stability Mechanism. And secondly, the COVID crisis, where you could clearly see if you create an open space where people circulate freely and you cannot provide for citizens protection um, in a health crisis, in a pandemic, of course, what happens is national governments take over and borders are being pulled up again. This is just one example where we see that pulling down borders without creating the necessary capacity to act and to protect on the European level will reach its limits as soon as a crisis hits. And so we argue that already now it makes sense to review the competencies of the EU for what has happened in the past, where the European Commission extended uh, its scope of action because it had to in a crisis moment, but not with the full participation of the European Parliament. Um, and secondly, we argue that there needs to be a true reflection on the question which public goods the EU should deliver to its citizens in the future. So we take this as an invitation forward to really reflect, given the new context the EU operates in, how it can deliver to citizens in a better way. I'll leave it there, Fran, because I know we just have an hour, but I'm happy to come in on any point in the questions. Thank you very much. And I should say on the, on the topic of questions, we invite questions from our audience and you can go to askac, that's A-S-K-A-C.org and please submit your questions. We look forward to receiving them. Uh, so let me go now to Shaheen Valley. Um, 
Shaheen, you have worked for President Macron and also President Van Rompuy. Um, there is a school of thought um, that um, enlargement and particularly enlargement involving treaty change, and you advocate treaty change in some, as an optimum measures in, in some instances in this report, is really too complicated. Um, and that the EU has adjusted during in past enlargements without necessarily going through all that. Um, I will say we've heard arguments about the EU needing to reform itself every time there's a major enlargement. Um, how do you see this report fitting with the realities of governing? Um, is this something that you think uh, there is an appetite for in the corridors where decisions are made or will we just get stuck as soon as the member states start talking about it? Thank you. This is a very good question. You know, in fact, European uh, uh, governments are quite schizophrenic about, about these issues. Because on one hand, they say, and actually this has been quite a foundation of our, of our report, and, and France and Germany have said both, that they agreed that before considering any enlargement, the EU should deepen, and that that deepening uh, required treaty change. So th both, you know, Emmanuel Macron in May 2022, and the Chancellor Scholz uh, in uh, in in August of, 10, of 2022 have basically said uh, so much. And yet, you're absolutely right that despite these commitments, there's always a bit of a reluctance to own and endorse a full uh, and, and comprehensive treaty reform. Uh, <clears throat> what we are, um, uh, you know, suggesting in this report is that a, a treaty reform is necessary irrespective of whether there is an enlargement or not. You know, the EU has enlarged its competences de facto through the euro crisis, through the COVID crisis, through the energy crisis, and that these would probably be better off enshrined in a new treaty rather than you know, developed in an ad hoc fashion uh, under duress. And B, we argue that in particular for the governance and the decision-making process in an enlarged Europe, we would need to, to, to change quite profoundly the way rules uh, for decision-making uh, uh, operate, and in particular expand the realm of qualified majority voting uh, uh, rather than, uh, than unanimity. And that, uh, you know, for the most part, requires a treaty reform. It can be done in some ways through what we call uh, passerelle clauses, and, and, and very many member states who are skeptical about treaty reforms. Uh, are suggesting only to rely on passerelle clauses, and that's indeed a solution which we view as a transitory and partial solution, but not one that can be applied to all the areas where we believe that treaty reform is is um, is needed. And I would I would stress, you know, to to hammer uh, the point on on the schizophrenia around treaty reform. We keep saying that we can't find the coalition or we cannot find the unanimous decision to reform the treaties, and we forget that we actually have more often than we think. Let me remind you that during the Euro crisis, we have actually opened and changed the treaty to create the European stability mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I don't really buy the argument that Europeans are not able uh, to do a treaty reform if it is necessary. In fact, they've proven time and again that they are. Of course, they're always reluctant to go down that path because when we open that Pandora's box, we, that Pandora's box, we don't really know what comes out of it. Uh, but I think, you know, if we are serious about this enlargement and serious about the geopolitical challenges that Europe is facing, we need to be uh, bolder than what we've been in, in the past. And, and I think this is entirely achievable. And mind you, I think public opinions are in fact more open to that than uh, many European governments uh, uh, make us uh, believe. Um, European public opinions are, you know, predominantly favorable to the enlargement, and they're predominantly in agreement that this needs to be accompanied with profound reforms of the governance of, of the EU. So I'm not saying it's easy, nothing is easy, uh, uh, but I also think that with enough political will, it is something that is uh, entirely within our reach. Thank you. Let's go over to Bart in Warsaw. Um, Bart, one of the big elements, as Daniela was saying at the beginning, one of the big elements in this report is rule of law and the importance of rule of law. 
Um, so I'd like you to reflect on that and how um, Poland and perhaps some other states in Central Europe might react to that. Um, but also Poland and Ukrainian relations have recently demonstrated one of the issues that has always surrounded enlargement and that's questions over resources. And here I point to the grain issue. Um, clearly for Poland, uh, this future enlargement has some very real uh, potential consequences in terms of the um, common agricultural policy and farm subsidies. Uh, how is that likely to play out? Bringing in Ukraine is not the same as bringing in a small country that's not an agricultural powerhouse. So could you respond to those two dilemmas that we'll face as, as enlargement moves forward? Thank you very much for those questions. I guess that these are like actually two toughest questions that probably <laughs> anyone from Warsaw could could have in this debate. Um, but it's uh, it's my pleasure actually also to be here and to to present maybe the Polish view on 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 the reforms. Uh, well, certainly there is an assumption right now that Poland is um, coming back to the European Union mainstream. Uh, the question is, of course, what is the mainstream right now? Because throughout the last eight years, this mainstream has become way more fragment, uh, fragmented than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, well, the new government, the TUS government, uh, will have the benefit of a newcomer, um, including, of course, there is a rise of the pro-European pro Union narrative all around Europe with the choice that Poles uh, made during the, the, the last elections. But it also means that the new government will be harder to ignore uh, when the opinions uh, coming from Warsaw will not necessarily be aligned with the ones that, are, that, that come from, from Paris or, or, or Berlin. <laughs> Um, well, the choice of the new government, and this is the, how we perceive that in, in Warsaw right now, is that it was certainly a pro-European choice of, of, of Poles. But at the same time, it wasn't, uh, and I will make it clear, it wasn't a pro-federalist cho choice. So mm -hmm. the vision of, of the future of the European Union not necessarily goes uh, in line with, with what was also presented in the, in the report. But it also means that um, that Poland uh, will have to redefine its priorities when it comes to the European Union um, policies. And that gives us, of course, um, a huge benefit, not only to, um, to open the discussion about the rule of law, and there is a strong commitment from the new government, there will be a strong commitment from the new government to make sure that, the, that Poland comes back to the the understanding of the rule of law that um, uh, that is present in in Brussels, that is present in Berlin, that is present or or across the European Union, but at the same time, it will certainly not be um, re responsive. Let me put it that way: will not be binded only by the um, by the opinions or by the proposals for the for the changes in the in the European Union institutions that are presented by uh, by the Western European countries. I guess that there is a strong um, understanding right now in uh, in Poland that we have to define our priorities uh, when it comes to European Union, the new European Union, that we want to be very active and, and creative in sense of, of inventing the new policies and taking part in those discussions. Um, but it also means that we'll have to build our capacities to pursue um, the regional coalitions that uh, Will have um, uh, that will most likely be uh, be bonded by the common understanding of where those uh, where those um, changes in the um, in the EU have to uh, have to take place, and as compared as uh, as probably as compared to to the to, to the views that are presented in the Franco-German report, a mm. lot of uh, what is being discussed currently in Poland um, uh, about the uh, the potential of the Euro European Union to respond to the to the crises um, is connected to the fact that we do not perceive um, uh, that only through the lens of the European Union institutions um, that actually the European Union is not limited only by the um, incapacity to act because the institutions are built that way uh, that way. But also, it is a result of some kind of the um, incapacity to uh, to formulate a form, uh, let's say, uh, broader foreign uh, foreign policy of of, mm -hmm. of the. 
that sometimes, of course, also means that uh, some of the capitals um, uh, are actually trying to, to pursue the, their own foreign policy without actually consulting that with, uh, with uh, also with Central European countries. And sometimes even uh, under the assumption that they're acting on behalf of the, of the whole union. I guess that China is a, is a great example for that. And that um, that feeling actually would would probably also stay with with the new government that will certainly be very pro-European, but would like to sometimes I would say contest the views that are coming from from Paris and Berlin. When it comes to the Ukraine um, uh, case, well, Poland is a strong supporter of the of the European Union enlargement, and especially when it comes to Ukraine. And um, this is uncontested politically, and will not be con contested politically by by the new government. Uh, but uh, you will have to take into account that this is actually mainly connected to our um, security related thinking. So for us, uh, integrated and prosperous Ukraine is actually probably the best sign that we can send to Russia and all the undemocratic mm -hmm. tendencies in Eastern Europe. Um, however, this commitment, uh, that's my opinion, actually stands mainly on moral ground. And uh, we still need a very hard and, uh, and detailed discussion uh, uh, about actually uh, the implications of that on the reform of the European Union and on the implications, of, of course, on the economy of uh, of Poland. Um, that is connected to what I was uh, talking about when it comes to defining or redefining our European priorities um, for the new government, that we also have to, to work at least for the first year and a half in a cohabitation with the, with the president that... Uh, Although being very pro-Ukraine is uh, is at the same time skeptical when it comes to the to the reforms in the European Union, uh, but it also um, it, it has it also has some implications on on our understanding uh, of the role of Poland within the newly reformed or, or about to, to to reform European Union, which means what what do we perceive or how do we perceive Poland? As a potential leader of Central and Eastern Europe, if that um, if we change the perspective, if 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 Poland instead of actually only uh, being able of uh, of blocking some uh, some activities and new policies uh, that are invented in uh, in in Brussels, Paris, or or Berlin, will try to to participate in those discussions. That also means the capacity to build regional uh, regional co coalitions, and in that way, actually. Um, sometimes uh, being constructive, but still skeptical to, to some of the opinions coming from the Western European uh, uh, countries. That will mean that uh, that Poland is back to the uh, to, to the EU as such. But as I said, this will mean that we are way more open to discuss things. Uh, we are committed to uh, get back to the to the understanding of the rule of law as it is uh, presented by by Brussels. But at the same time. Um, we will be very, um, very eager, I would say, to define our priorities when it comes to the future of the European Union that sometimes, unfortunately, not necessarily go um, in line with what was presented in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Dimitro, let's go over to you. Um, you are on the other side of this discussion, so to speak, in being the, the major accession country uh, uh, in in the line, and I think it is, as I said at the top, um, it is due to Ukraine that we are seeing this enlargement debate speed up um, and energize. What are you looking for from the EU? There is obviously a great deal that Ukraine needs to do, but what are you looking for from the EU in terms of your ambitions? What will, we have seen some prospective member states, some candidate countries pull back a little bit because they get discouraged. I think Daniela mentioned that at the, at the beginning. What is going to help, what from the EU will help Kiev move forward in this direction? Uh, yes, Fran, uh, thank you for a very good question, um, by the way, and uh, thank you for giving me an option for a debut uh, at the Atlantic Council. Um, and to answer it, uh, I must say that uh, we must thank Putin, I guess, for having such possibility of talking of uh, accession at all. So because uh, my think tank and uh, our team uh, 
we've been working on the association agreement agenda, mainly starting from the very beginning um, of an agreement draft, uh, I guess. And I expected before that we would start an accession talks, um, let's say somewhere in 2035 or 2040. And um, it, it it occurred, of course, uh, very suddenly, uh, you know, an extremely in an extremely fast manner, and of course the war uh, has distorted significantly the con the context of um, our negotiations and uh, our readiness to join the EU and uh, our capacity to do this, uh, as well as the European Union, as uh, yeah Daniela and Shahin uh, uh, correctly noted. Uh, from the point of view of Ukraine, of course, uh, we would like to have uh, uh, the smooth and rational accession process uh, without having having any kind of blockers, I mean, formal and informal, that could potentially impede uh, our um, accession way, way to the full EU membership. Uh, there are very different, uh, let's say, uh, angles of this problem, uh, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, as we can see it in, inside our think tank, uh, the accession should be divided uh, on resolving the very short-term short and urgent needs and reaching the very long-term uh, needs or needs to make a kind of fundamental reforms. So because uh, from one perspective, uh, uh, our current stance uh, and uh, a number of war inflicted damage that uh, occurred uh, to our I mean, political system and national economy, that should be resolved now. Uh, um, including also the uh, pre-accession instruments or accession instruments uh, as, 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 as you like it. So because we need uh, some kind of uh, uh, right now remedies to support uh, our economy in times of war and uh, currently we are preparing for, for the long-term war. And uh, the European Union uh, needs to provide our uh, to us, um, uh, you know, a kind of emergency support. So the Ukrainian facility is one uh, story in this regard. So uh, probably it would be also um, other kinds of uh, pre-accession support. I mean, we still don't know. Uh, and uh, as a concept of uh, staged or organic integration, uh, is also in favor in Kiev right now because uh, it could also provide um, some quick benefits for our trade oriented uh, industries that now uh, uh, became appeared appeared even more closer to the EU markets than it was before because um, you know the war cut off of uh, our economy from the major export routes and uh, yes wanted it we or no <laughs> now the European Union is our main main partner and the grain story is a good illustration uh, of the conflict of, of of such kind so because the European Union or the Central Eastern Europe wasn't ready to such dramatic shifts in the grain export flows we as a western border so that my brief answer. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, it's quite an ambitious agenda, but I want to focus a little bit uh, closer to our current uh, calendar, if I can, in going back to Daniela. We've had a question from Nasa Oksvik at the Wilson Center um, about the role of the European Parliament elections, their impact on potential reform. And of course, we also have um, the election of the next commission president uh, in the fall of 24, uh, after the EP elections. And just to make the storm more perfect, we will have as of June or July in 24, the Hungarian presidency of the council. So can you talk about how all these things may either delay or boost um, 
reform efforts. And I'd love for you to say a word about um, what the report has said about the Spitzenkandida system, uh, because that has proven to be so controversial in the past. Yeah, thanks very much, Brian, and thanks to the question from the audience, um, for the question from the audience. Now, um, yeah, indeed, the uh, electoral calendar is pretty tight. Um, and it's not just the EP elections, but also a bunch of national elections that will really change or can change the political landscape next year in the European Union. The way we dealt with it in the report was to say, we think that there is a window of opportunity for reforms that are based or can be based on the Lisbon Treaty uh, until next spring, uh, May at the very latest. And we make a number of pretty hands-on proposals that should be looked at um, by now, you know, the Spanish presidency and then the next, um, the Belgian EU presidency. And we really argue that things won't get easier, um, not only because we have to expect that the next European Parliament may have a composition where um, far right or at least anti-EU forces may have more weight than they currently have. And it can also be a more divided parliament where coalition building and the whole functioning may be more difficult than it is now. Um, so we take those short-term measures and then we also discuss the big challenge of selecting the EU leadership. You mentioned the Spitzenkandidaten system, which uh, the governments didn't endorse um, now. So some parties will still run with Spitzenkandidaten, which we generally, at least many of the group thought is a good idea. Um, what we say is that the biggest political task actually is to make sure that after the European parliamentary elections, there's not a big fight over the question how to install the e new EU leadership, how to select the commission president, but that the um, heads of state and government ideally would agree on certain principles for election um, or for the selection, because it's not only them selecting, but they have to take account into account the composition of the parliament because they need uh, the whole commission um, to be ratified by the parliament. So our concern is really that in these times, which are full of an inner EU agenda of reform and policy making, then the whole enlargement agenda plus crisis management, which won't go away if we look at our neighborhood, if we look at the overall geopolitical context, that not too much time is lost in infighting and actually mm -hmm. making it to, to select that new EU leadership. Um, then, you know, what, what, what follows is that the new EU leadership, and this is going to be prepared by the current European Council, needs to adopt some kind of strategy. In our view, and that's really where the report is, is very, very clear, and, and Shaheen also emphasized that, reform and enlargement have to go hand in hand. We say that the next period for the new commission and parliament should be used to advance decisively on those reforms because we, we think that the EU needs to declare that it will be enlargement ready by 2030. This is to discipline decision-making within but also to send a very, very clear signal to candidate countries that the EU is now serious about its promise to accept new members. And you said rightly, Fran, that the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Moldova and then the application of the two countries really accelerated the process and brought this issue back on the political agenda. And in my view, the most important thing now politically is to show on the EU side we are ready to deliver to encourage those political parties or even whole governments that are serious and the candidate countries to advance that they really have grounds to believe this will get somewhere because we cannot afford another decade of you know of paralysis or even stalemate so it's really important to use this momentum and work with a very clear schedule thanks for that um, I think we're all looking forward to seeing the uh, elections in the spring and then following those of us in the U.S. who may not have to actually live through it, but can watch very uh, closely the selection of the next uh, commission president. Um, Shaheen, let me come to you. And um, France has always been a key foreign policy actor within the EU. 
how does this report, how does what the group suggested affect EU foreign policy and um, cohesion in that foreign policy? Will an actor such as France, which is quite well known for sometimes striking out on its own or being ahead of the pack, if I can put it that way, what, how do you see this report and your recommendations bringing everyone together or how it, will it impact European foreign policy? Well, you know, one thing we mentioned in this report in the expansion of QMV is to expand it, as you pointed out, to uh, foreign policy. And this is, in fact, a, an offer, and I think it should be viewed as such, that was made by Chancellor Scholz uh, in his uh, important speech in August 2022, where he essentially says, if we want to deepen Europe, we need to expand QMV and we need to expand it at least in two areas that are highly symbolic and potentially sensitive. One is foreign policy, which is highly symbolic and sensitive in France, as you pointed out. Yeah. And the other is tax policy, which is uh, equally sensitive in, in, in Germany. And I think you're asking a, you know, a, a, very, a very important question. Is France ready uh, and prepared to uh, subject um, foreign policy decisions to QMV in Europe? Uh, and I think the quick answer to that simple question is probably no. You know, France at this point is not prepared for a number of historical reasons. And at the same time, uh, France and Macron in particular um, uh, is very adamant that Europe needs to develop a common strategic culture, that Europe needs to strengthen its strategic autonomy. And there is really no way of doing that under uh, unanimous decision making. Right. So, you know, we will never speak with one voice if every uh, member state, including the smallest one, can object to a common decision. And so I think France, you know, needs to, um, you know, tr needs to find uh, a coherent position between this strong plea uh, for strategic autonomy uh, and uh, an, an equally strong legacy of being independent in making foreign policy decisions. These two things, in fact, are not absolutely consistent and there needs to be a, a movement. Now, you know, what we stress in the report is that some of these issues may involve um, issues of actual or perceived uh, national strategic interest. And in these cases, of course, uh, member states, you know, should be able to opt out or to um, or, or or to block a decision, but only in these uh, in these extreme uh, in these extreme cases. And I think uh, beyond uh, foreign policy, what we advocate in this report, which might be even more sensitive, is that you know there is no such thing as a foreign policy without a defense policy that is there to back it. And so what we're saying is, you know, we need to expand QMV beyond foreign policy to also certain uh, uh, defense policy. And there again, you know, I think France is probably very reluctant to do that. And at the same time, France has also seen firsthand how difficult it is to build a European defense uh, capacity if every single member states can object to defend uh, this national industrial champion or this, you know, manufacturer versus this one. So I think this is the real uh, tension, you know, uh, you know, we need to make important concessions if we want a strategic Europe to emerge. And it might be more difficult for France uh, than for other countries who may have less to lose in that transition. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there is no building of a European strategic autonomy without these, these concessions. And I think France is slowly walking that, that, that journey. So Bart, let me get you to react to that and particularly Poland's likely stance. Should there be a QMD in foreign policy areas? Um, when you look at this report, that's one specific question, but when you look at this report and I take your point that this is a Franco-German report and perhaps it doesn't reflect the views of those in Central Europe um, and certainly in Poland, but what would you see as essential reforms before enlargement, if any, are needed? And how would you feel about how is Poland likely to react to QMV and foreign policy? 
Well, so I would say that the major opinion right now in Poland is that there is um, there is no need for major changes, and and that was expressed also by uh, by the possible new new prime minister recently, and um, and that is especially when it comes to the QMV voting. But um, if you want my personal opinion, after actually reading the uh, the report. Uh, there are at least a couple of things that, in uh, in my opinion, might actually um, impact Polish point of view and be the basis for 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 debates when it comes to to QMV voting, and that will be firstly um, the uh, the proposal to uh, to rebalance the voting shares uh, within the QMV prior to to make make that as to 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 to, uh, to to make QMV the basis for 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 the decisions in the foreign and security policy. Secondly, that will be actually binding the uh, the change to the accession treaties. Uh, so especially that means no major changes uh, shall be done uh, on a lower level, lower legal level. So without actually changing the treaties, and if that would be a change in the treaties, that should be actually directly uh, linked to the to the accession treaty. Um, and uh, thirdly, I would say that uh, it, it's all, it is all about actually also linking the debate um, uh, about the future of the European Union to the, to the new opening in the bilateral relations between Poland, um, France and Germany, um, especially in the area of security and Russia policy. So if on the bilateral level between Warsaw, Paris and, and Berlin, uh, we will see that there is actually um, uh, an understanding and consensus about the security policy and the consensus about the, um, the policy on Russia that will that may actually positively impact the Polish mm -hmm. stance on, on the changes um, in, the, in, in the decision making process in the European Union. Uh, but at this point, uh, uh, at this point of time, uh, I cannot see that coming like uh, very shortly. So. Uh, so the you know the, the whole fact that the, the process speed up uh, uh, recently um, is 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 not positively um, uh, commented in, in in Poland and uh, and you have to take into account that especially when we talk about the security and defense policy um, in Poland we still have that belief that actually maybe not even a reformed European Union shall shall be uh, and is actually the most effective club to make those decisions. There is. Uh, we, we we will really cherish the transatlantic link in that regard, and um, the opinion is uh, that, that of course NATO is uh, is way more way more efficient, and that, that would be our priority when it comes to the to, to the shape of the of the security and defense policy. And that would also mean that uh, we'd like to hear, of course, from uh, from our Western partners the commitment to, um, to first of all the the NATO priorities in terms of security, and then discussion about the, uh, the those uh, areas of policy within European Union. Thank you. Um, and Dimitra, let me ask you about another element in the report, and then I want to go to Daniela and Shaheen to respond to both of you. Um, and that is uh, the concentric circles, if I can put it, that the report outlined. One was a very inner core, uh, Schengen, the Euro, um, enhanced cooperation in certain areas. Another one was membership, as we think of it in the treaty sense. Another one was associate membership, where you could sit at the table but not vote, I think is the best way to describe it. And then the European political community. Ukraine has a long, hard road uh, ahead of it in terms of becoming a member. Would associate membership be something that would be considered? Or is it only membership? Do you see associate membership as a way to kind of keep some countries at bay, if I can put it that way. Oh, I, I guess uh, Daniela and Shahina are the best responders <laughs> to, this, um, to this issue. But uh, of course, uh, when we first read uh, the report, we, we are very much afraid that Ukraine will be pushed back again to the association status. Uh, that we've had uh, before uh, our candidate status. Uh, but um, as I understand the situation now, uh, this association circle uh, uh, 
uh, is designed, uh, I mean, um, for, for, for the countries uh, that uh, wouldn't pursue the political integration uh, with the European Union and uh, keeping only um, the trade uh, trade relations or sectoral integration uh, or access to the European Union sin single market, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, which is obviously not is the case uh, for Ukraine uh, because uh, yes, uh, uh, our ultimate target um, uh, to be a, a full-fledged uh, EU member uh, one day. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we will undertake, uh, I mean, any commitments, including uh, uh, all the painful stuff of the rule of law clauses, uh, uh, yes, uh, to fulfill everything, uh, to be to be a full-fledged EU member. Let's say uh, the second tier, the second circle would be um, sufficient uh, for us and reasonable. Oh, okay. Um, Daniela, let me ask you to come back on uh, Bart's concerns. And Shaheen, then let's go to you and talk a little bit about this differentiation with Daniela. And let me remind our audience, we have um, about 10, 12 minutes. We'd love to get one or two more questions in. Go to askac.org. Go ahead, Daniela. Yeah, thanks, Fran. And I will do that, but I will also briefly comment on internal differentiation because I think this, you know, partially goes in pairs. Now, um, we did discuss the question of, of national sovereignty and how to make sure that countries are not held in a framework that doesn't work for them or are not obliged to pursue uh, policies or, or, you know, abide by decisions that are really fundamentally in contradiction to their national preferences. And for that matter, if you look closely at the way we suggest to extend qualified majority voting, um, which, by the way, is the regular decision making procedure in the EU already, so this decision has been taken, we speak about an extension of QMV to other member states. We say that this should happen um, under certain conditions. One of our suggestions is, and this wasn't really uh, something that would please the French and the German governments, we say the voting rights should be rebalanced. Um, and so Germany and France, as the largest countries, would relatively lose to make sure that those countries who feel we are on the small or medium-sized side of things and we never influence decisions as we would like to, that they feel they have a bigger weight. Um, on uh, the question, you know, who, who goes ahead with QMV and who doesn't, we also make the suggestion that whenever a policy is transferred to qualified majority voting, there should be opt-outs, um, not only through a national safety net and a precise decision, but also in general, if a new policy is introduced and it is decided upon with QMV, countries should be able to not be part of it. So we really try to make this as open as possible for the choice of member countries and future member countries where they want to sit. But we do see a big need to actually make it possible for countries to move ahead and to take strategic decisions without always the threat of a veto, because we know that some countries use it and they use it across policy areas. So just to threaten uh, the EU27, mm -hmm. it happens that single countries use a veto, although they are actually not really interested in this particular policy decision, but in a very different one. And this puts the system into deadlock, and that's why we say it should be extended. I want to briefly speak about the concentric circles, because they, again, the internal differentiation in the EU27, there we say nothing radically new. We, we describe the status quo through the concentric circles. And the question goes to Shaheen, so I won't say more at this point, but I do want to emphasize that our reflection was coming from the inside, looking at the EU as it is and asking ourselves, how can we make the system functional with more member states coming in? And if we pose clear, um, let's say conditions and a clear framework, how decisions will be made in the European Union, countries should have a choice where they want to move. And that can also mean moving out of the inner core. The one thing that you cannot differentiate, and that's the red line in our concentric circles, is the rule of law. 
there's no way for a full EU27 member to get some kind of exempt exception from this rule. And that's why we say uh, the rule of law line is actually the most essential one. And it is up to the countries to choose which degree of political integration they want and whether they want to abide by these norms or not. And that is actually, in our view, really also a message to countries within the EU that they will have to face that moment of truth, whether they really want to be in the inner core. So let me just follow up on that very briefly, because in talking about the accession countries, you talk about reversibility of the process. Um, but there's also a hint that, that, as you say, countries would have to evaluate whether they want to stay as members of the EU, is it possible that you would also see the EU decide that certain countries who do not uphold the rule of law should leave? Sorry, was that a follow up to me or to Shaheen already? Yeah, to you, Daniela, just to follow mm -hmm. okay. up briefly on that. Well, we do not suggest to include uh, an exemption clause, but we had long discussions on that. First of all, we don't think it's politically realistic to include one. And also, it would have a huge cost for the EU as a system, and in particular also for the Eurozone. If, you know, if there is more exit credibility, the sustainability and the stability of the system um, is more easily endangered. Let's put it that way. Because you okay. need in particular in the Eurozone, you need reliability and and the expectation that this will hold. Otherwise, the monetary system won't work. However, we develop certain ideas how you can really make it more costly to not abide by those principles. And we also say that legally, there must be a way to exclude countries from certain areas of integration if they don't abide by those norms. Um, okay. So we actually say the conditions, so for a country that violates the rule of law principle, the conditions of its membership in the community needs need to change in such a way that at the end of the day, the country faces a tougher choice to either comply by the norms or not to have the benefits of EU integration or even a certain cost. So we put it back to the governments to actually make up their minds. That's why on several occasions within the report, we speak of a moment of truth because the EU is a community where countries made a huge leap sort of of trust, of confidence, and also of self-commitment um, to join rules and principles. And it needs to be a political choice of the governments, whether they want to continue to do so or whether they don't, and then they have to leave the club. But, uh, an exemption clause is nothing we suggest, though we raise the issue and, you know, our group didn't land and say this should be what we suggest, but we note the absence thereof and thus make other proposals how to, um, in a way, sanction countries that don't abide by principles they themselves sign up to. Okay, so uh, Shaheen, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the concentric circles, but also you mentioned that um, countries would have in foreign policy kind of a national sovereignty uh, reservation, if you will. And Daniela also mentioned that countries wouldn't have to move forward with QMV, they could get kind of opt outs uh, in particular areas. How is that different from the system that there is today? Um, because we have had things like that in the past. So how would that avoid the problems that you describe? No, uh, so you know, you're, you're very right to point to this contradiction. Uh, in principle, if people want to abuse the system that we're designing, they can. And we can therefore, you know, as a result of that, revert to the status quo ante. I would still nonetheless point to uh, a bias in the current system, which is that issues that are currently supposed to be under QMV are in fact becoming a uh, unanimous decision when they are escalated to the European Council. So let's take the example of a piece of legislation that the ECOFIN ministers cannot agree to. It's supposed to be QMV voting. They don't want to put in minority some members of the council and therefore they say, well, let's kick this up to the European Council and the European heads of states and government will basically give us direction. 
By doing so, they're effectively transferring something that is supposed to be voted under QMV to the European Council, which, which acts under uh, consensus, and therefore they're, they're transforming something that should be QMV under unanimity. So, I mean, all of that to say that there are ways to abuse the system in one way or, or, or the other. And of course, you know, none of what we're proposing is, is bulletproof to these, uh, to these uh, abuses. But um, if there is a general willingness to go down the expansion of QMV, we would hope that member states don't, you know, the minute they have agreed to put, you know, foreign policy under QMV, invent all sorts of, you know, national safeguards and national security clauses. Some of them are legitimate and should be heard, you know, not to be mistaken. But, you know, there will also be a natural tendency to, uh, to stretch that. And this is where, you know, in this gray area that, that, that we need to, uh, to clarify things. One word on, on the differentiation, and I'm not going to repeat what, what Daniele said on, on, the, on the logic of the associate membership status, uh, which I think was very clear. One thing I think that was a bit of a leap of faith in our report was the role that we gave to the European political community. You know, we describe the European political community as an area of policy coordination that could basically help organize the continent beyond the EU and an area de facto where, you know, we could coordinate policies with countries that would either not be in the EU yet or that would have left the EU. So I'll, I'll be quick. And so the leap of faith is that the EPC today is not that. The EPC today is just a forum of heads of states meeting every six months and not even agreeing to a common press conference, to a common statement, to a G20 or G8 type of, of communique. So what we're describing is an EPC that needs to be transformed to become more institutionalized in order to perform that function of being a, a, a policy coordinating uh, body, in particular when it comes to foreign policy and geopolitical challenges. And so that's not yet the case, but we hope that it will be the case in the future. So we have just a couple of minutes and I want to get to Bart and Dimitro for last words. Bart, one question we've had from uh, the audience is about the uh, 2030 date that President Michel has put forward uh, as a date for accession. And um, the report comes out in favor of that. Is that realistic from your point of view? Is that, does that help the agenda to have a definite date? Very quick response, if you could, please. I'm positively skeptical. Uh, of course, a lot will be uh, will depend on the on the path of those reforms, and I'm sure that uh, our friends from from Germany and and France will 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 have this link to the to the enlargement. And uh, but it's also um, a lot of depends of the, of the external at the, um, external events such as uh, the result of the elections in the U.S. etc. I mean, this 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 will have some profound effect on. On the future um, shape of the European Union, I'm certain about it. Uh, Dimitro, this is a big question to ask you in uh, basically a yes or no. But um, what do you think um, will happen if the conflict goes on? So, do you think that it's possible for Ukraine to join, or is it even more important that Ukraine joins the EU if the conflict becomes lengthy? Oh, let, let, let's say it shouldn't be conditional to our accession at first. So, okay. uh, yeah, I also read in the report that there is a clause that, okay, an exceeding country should close any kind of hot conflict right. uh, on its territory. And um, it's a type of uh, dragging on sink uh, because, yes, this, this, this war may, may last for the next uh, couple of years or so even decade. I, I don't know. Because we face uh, currently uh, the war of attrition, uh, yes, yeah, that, 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 that may, may be protracted. Yes, uh, for Ukraine, it's extremely important uh, to start uh, the full scale preparation. Uh, to its membership to, to start now because uh, any kind of uh, uh, you know uh, freezing clauses uh, like it was uh, in case of the session agreement so okay ukraine will uh, enter when it's ready so um, you know we we need to invest uh, substantial efforts uh, now i'm talking about uh, our country our capacity but as well as uh, for the european union 
hospital because uh, we need to undergo a uh, very dramatic and fundamental um, you know change in our political system um, economy so even even inside you know inside societal patterns just to become uh, a, a full full-fledged uh, new member so we need we need to start we need a uh, um, smart and coherent planning of the process and uh, uh, we need a good a good motivation for both sides. I mean, the EU and Ukraine, uh, yeah, uh, to be one day together. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to our incredible panel here. It's a fascinating report, uh, and I know it's going to generate a lot of discussion. It already has been generating a lot of discussion in Europe, um, but I think we will have to see how we how the EU starts to move forward. Um, but what I'm looking forward to is a continuation of this debate over enlargement rather than having it stuck as it has been. So thanks very much to the panel, to the authors of the report for kickstarting that debate, if I can put it that way. And thanks very much for our audience today. Enjoy the rest of your day from the Atlantic Council. Thank you.